Welcome, Dolphins fans, haters, and everyone in between to your favorite show discussing the greatest franchise in sports, the Miami Dolphins. This is the Fins Pod. My name is Moose, your host, and wow, is this actually victory week? It has been a long time since we've had one, seven weeks to be exact, but the Dolphins pulled out a win in a wild weekend of football, and despite that win, there were still frustrating moments throughout the game, mainly offensively, and we'll get into that as we have been over the last seven weeks, but the defense played pretty well, so credit there, and we were finally able to slay the Goliath that is Tyrod Taylor. We finally got to him. We got a lot coming today, so stay right there, and let's dive in. Firstly, I want to apologize for the little hiatus of the show. Not only has the season been a little depressing, but I actually took the LSAT last week, so I was a little busy, but we're back and a solid time to return considering the Miami Dolphins blessed us with a win and the 49ers blessed us with a loss. Things are looking slightly better than just a few days ago. Miami managed to win the battle of one in seven teams at home against the Houston Texans. Now, some general takeaways from the game. Why is it that the Dolphins only decide to get creative defensively when they face trash teams? Why aren't they this confident week in and week out? I feel Miami would have put up much better performances early on this year if they managed to apply any level of pressure like they did against Tyrod Taylor. The unit that did win us this game was unquestionably the defense, obviously. Both Xavier Howard and Byron Jones on the outside had pretty good days. Jones was targeted way more often, and he did allow some plays matched up against the Texans' wide receivers, but considering how often he was targeted, he did not perform too shabbily. Javon Holland recorded his first career interception, so kudos there. And his overall awareness on the back end, it's seemingly getting better as he gets his legs under him, which is just a sliver of hope for this defense going forward. Another sliver of hope, Jalen Phillips. And although he didn't have a wild game in terms of numbers and sack production, it's clear that he is getting more and more comfortable. He's around the ball a lot. He's around the passer a lot. And he continues to be generally disruptive in that pass rush. And his hustle and effort, you notice this on plays where he might not even make the play. It might end up being a positive play for the offense. But he is putting his all out there. And that's inspiring to see. And it's good to see him get better. And you hope that Boyer and Flores continue to put him out there to get more reps and put him in position to succeed. Because at the very least here, regardless of all at the top, all the issues which we'll get into, there are players who are going to be pieces going forward, regardless of, you know, who's managing the team, who's coaching the team. So you want to see some growth so you know there is hope at the end of the tunnel. Ogba, he was also a menace, and whether or not Miami actually decides to pay him, I think that depends ultimately on whether the Dolphins retain Flores, whether a new regime comes in and they want to pay a young pass rusher, you know, a pretty premier price tag because he's been really good now for two years and he's young and, you know, he showed flashes when he was young, you know, before coming to Miami as well. He just wasn't able to stay healthy. So he's proven he can stay healthy. And when he is healthy, he is, like I said, a menace. He's been consistent, you know, not world beating, not like one of the elite pass rushers in this game, but definitely one of the better performers on this defense. Jerome Baker's return was pleasant. We were hearing a lot of Baker slander in these streets. People saying there was not much of a drop off when Jerome the homie was out. I disagree. When the defense is clicking and all three levels are in sync, his presence, it's a positive. It's just that when things aren't clicking, because he's right there in the middle of the defense, he just hangs out to dry and looks the worst over the middle. Everyone sees him. Everyone sees the guy miss the tackle. It makes him look the worst when the defense as a whole isn't performing. Now, that doesn't mean, don't get me wrong, that he hasn't played poorly. He has played poorly. We've gotten not the best play from number 55, especially considering he got a contract extension. But 
in terms of his long-term fit, as long as Flo remains, or honestly, any coach comes in here who wants athleticism and, and dynamicism from their linebackers, not only in their ability to rush the passer, but be a presence in the pass game, be able to actually cover a running back or pick up a tight end, which Jerome can do. And when you consider how bad some of these linebackers are these days, that is an asset. So I would expect Baker to continue to be the middle of this unit. You just hope he improves, specifically his tackling ability. Now, if this defense continues to get better, or at least play at the level that they have shown recently, do they have a chance to go on a little bit of a run here? Yeah, they do. But the reason it likely isn't going to happen is simple. I don't care if this defense returns to 2020 form. This offense is garbage from the top down, from management, personnel, player development, game planning, execution, garbage. Remember, this season was ultimately about progressing as a team, but also getting a true evaluation of your quarterback. And I don't care if you think Tua has struggled mightily this season, if you think when he's out there he sucks, I don't care that he's missed four starts. We're not getting a true evaluation of Tua Tungavailoa. The next team that lands him, they're likely going to get that evaluation. George Godsey, he's not returning at the very least. And although, yes, we can bitch and moan about how much turnover that means for Flores' offensive coaching staff if Flores returns, which I do believe he will return. And obviously that's going to be an evolving narrative as the time goes, as weeks progress. Because I do think the reason right now my stance is Flores is likely going to return. Do I want that? Not necessarily. But we're going to get the next eight games to see. Well, seven with the bye week. But we're going to get an opportunity to watch how this team responds down the stretch. And if there is semblance of life, then you know what? I do think he returns. Now, like I said, George Godsey, no, 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 no. I want us next year to have some competent coaching and just competent management for the offensive side of the ball. And it, look, it all starts with coaching when we criticize the offense. And I'm not saying anything new here. You know this too. There's no rhythm, no identity, and there's just no go-to options for this offense. Yeah, Mike Kosicki is a god. And Jalen Waddell has been great in the slot, but do they ever seem to get schemed open, right? Does it seem like the offense is setting those guys up for success? Or does their success usually happen in the form of a bailout? Because they're bailing us out because the rest of the offense can't do shit and they're making the plays. It's generally the latter. It's not like, oh man, what a great route concept by the Dolphins to get Waddle streaking down the middle of the field. Oh man, what a great way to pull the defense up high so you have Gesicki running over the middle. No, that never happens. It's always, holy crap, it's third and 12 and we're losing by two touchdowns and we, uh, there's Gesicki, throw it to him. That's what I mean by no identity. Gesicki's great, Waddle's great, but they're not in a system that's actually making them the best they can be. The offensive line as well, and I think this is a big factor. Obviously, that's the coaching when I talk about the concepts and how bad the offense has looked with no identity. That's the coaching. But ultimately, there is bad play on the field, and that starts with the offensive line. The Austin Jackson experiment, I was you know, not hopeful as the season was going on early you know, in the last couple months, but I was at least hoping maybe you'd see some development. Maybe the kick into guard is good, but that experiment needs to be over. Rookie Robert Jones, even Derval Kiraz Neto, give them some, you know, opportunities at this point because we need some semblance of protection for whatever quarterback, honestly, at this point plays for the Miami Dolphins. Look, the team has the weapons to make something work. You got Gasicki, Waddle, Albert Wilson isn't total garbage, and you have solid depth with Durham Smythe. And backs are decent in the passing game as well with Savon Ahmed and My and Miles Gaskin, but. When you have a coach who doesn't watch the game from the bigger picture, when he doesn't understand the game at a level that you need to when going against these really intelligent defensive coordinators, you're going to struggle. And it feels like this team's offense, it, they kind of go play to play. That whole mentality of week to week, day to day, minute to minute. I get that when you're preparing and trying to focus on your opponent. But when you're in the game, you know, understand that there's four quarters and there's momentum swings and things matter. But this offense just seems to go play to play. They adjust what they have to do based on what occurred the play before and the down and distance they're currently in. So it's like, you know, Forget that we haven't been able to run the ball up the middle 
all game long. We just had a nice quick slant that got us six yards at second and four. Well, let's ignore everything we know about our offensive production so far. Hmm, what generally happens on second and four? Yeah, well, uh, let's run the ball. Maybe we can get, you know, a first down. Oh, well, oh, look at that loss of one. Like, that's what I mean by play to play. They don't think about what's been going on. They don't go back to the things, you know, that work. They, there's nothing being set up misdirections play you know run back-to-back -back plays to exploit something you're seeing in the defense anything like there's no creativity no intelligence to these play calls and it doesn't help that the backup quarterback who's unfortunately played four games if, if five games honestly like we've said before he's the worst out there he sees the field at such a limited level. He holds on to the ball for too long. He isn't good. He's not a great enough athlete either to make up for it, right? Like, if he if he was some dynamic athlete who struggled with his arm talent as well, I see the appeal. Like, it's a, a Cam Newton in the latter days of Cam's career. I get that. But that's not what's happening. That's not at all what's happening. He's not a great athlete. And his accuracy at when he throws the ball is generally suspect. Look, Tua may not be performing at a high level right now, this point in the season, although some weeks he might have, but consistently we're talking about, he might not have performed at that high level. But considering his situation, right, what we've gathered about not only the dysfunction from the top, but also the way that the offense is actually executing on Sundays, he's got no chance and look, his competition is Brissett, and it's clear that we need Tua to function at any level as an offense. Now, moving to our regular segment following a Dolphins game, studs and duds. Our first stud on the shallow victory week is tight end Mike Gesicki. No, si no surprise here because clearly he's the team MVP so far. Gesicki made a couple highlight reel grabs showcasing his pure talent and honestly just how badly this team is wasting that talent. Miami has to resign Mike Kosicki, and I fear, based on, you know, the stupidity they've shown, that they're not going to. He may price himself out of that budget that they have for a quote-unquote one-dimensional tight end. You know, he can't stick his hand in the dirt and block. Who cares? He can change the fabric of a game. Someone is going to end up paying Kosicki, and they're going to get themselves an elite player who's honestly only ascending. Barring, obviously, any serious injury, Gasicki's physical abilities, and based on what we see him be able to do with those abilities on Sunday, it makes that ceiling scary high. He finished with four tough receptions for 54 yards. Yeah, his yards and catch numbers weren't crazy, but when you consider the momentum that those catches generated, where they were in the game, he elevates to our first stud. Our first dud, Austin Jackson. He was once again atrocious. Frankly, I feel like you could honestly play this segment, the studs and duds segment, at, like on repeat every single week because nothing changes. Kasiki's awesome. Austin Jackson blows. Look, he's a failed develop developmental left tackle and a failed experiment at guard now. The coaching staff's inability to actually be cognizant and aware of that and make a change baffles me and I think it's baffling a lot of Dolphins fans and the NFL community at large what are they doing with this offensive line our second stud of the game Javon Holland yes he gets points off due to a fumble that he did have on a punt return but considering he shouldn't really be the return guy to begin with he's a defensive back not a receiver so fumbling is a little more excusable now, where it counts on defense, Holland was all over the place. And it was exciting to see glimpses of what Flores drafted Holland to be for this team. Not only was he rangy in coverage, getting that interception in the end zone early in the game, he was also used often in that amoeba front as a blitzer. He's explosive, similar to Brandon Jones and what we've seen him able to do as that blitzing safety. But unlike Brandon Jones, I think Holland is a much better tackler. So on that front, if he ever blitzes and it's a run play or the quarterback tries to escape, I have way more faith that Javon Holland's going to make that tackle versus Brandon Jones, who we've seen, although he's been solid this season and as a rookie, he does struggle occasionally to wrap up and make that tackle. Javon Holland got a sack, and he was also in on a few more pressures throughout the game. The better Holland becomes, the better this defense can generally be. Now, our next dud, the rest of the offensive line, aside from maybe Robert Hunt and Mance at center. So really, Austin Jackson at guard and the tackles. This unit is not getting better, and I think that blame goes to a couple places. Not only coaching, but an inability for the unit to gel and improve and picking up stunts, right, and just being aware of the game and how your line works, being disciplined in those blocking assignments. But there's also a clear void 
in talent. It's not like we're seeing guys underachieve, really. We're not, you know, we're not seeing like a Jesse Davis we haven't seen before. We're seeing exactly who Jesse Davis is. We know who Austin Jackson has shown himself to be at this point. And the game planning around that and the preparation isn't bailing any of these guys out at all. There's no consistent tight ends to help these tackles. There's no ch- shifts to, frankly, the players being put out there. Look, although uh, Liam Eikenberg has struggled this year, considering the way he was used in training camp, bounced around, never really allowed to settle, considering he has a liability on the inside there with him that he can't really rely on in Austin Jackson at left guard, I'm not too worried about these early struggles com- when you consider the state of the rest of the offensive line. I do believe he still could become something good based on what we saw of him at Notre Dame and some flashes this season. If you put a you know veteran guard there, an experienced or even just a good guard there, a competent one, maybe Eichenberg can step up his game. Michael Dieter, he's shown promise. Maybe he can fill that role. And Robert Hunt is a potential piece as well. Hell, Austin Reeder could be salvageable. You know, he was a starting lineman for a Super Bowl team, but when it comes to line play, you're generally only an offensive line play, not on defense as much, but offensive line play, you're only as good as your weakest link. And Miami's weakest links on the offensive line on a chain link are made out of goddamn paper. Our final stud for Miami in their, vi- in their second victory of 2021, rookie wideout Jalen Waddle. Look, Argue all you want about Miami not using him properly, looking at his average yards per catch in college when you compare him here in the NFL, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that in the here and now, he's making plays for the team, and consistently throughout the year, Waddle has been showing up for Miami. And the fact that he's showing he can be a dependable guy in the short game is not a bad thing. We already know he can run deep. That's been proven. It's promising, though, to see his versatility as a weapon. Despite his eight catches for 83 yards, I will say, though, his run after catchability has not been as advertised. It, it doesn't ever feel like Waddle has room to run after he catches the ball. The escapability that, you know, we were promised a little bit hasn't shown through. Now, that could easily be attributed to what we talked about earlier, you know, his role in this offense and how he's being used. It's hard to be explosive when you're consistently running routes in the middle of the defense or short down the field where you're not really being set up to run after the catch. Now, honorary stud for this game, and some of you might be like, he should have been stud number one. Emmanuel Ogba. Ogba finished the game with two and a half sacks. And aside from Jalen Phillips, he too has been a consistent force for the defense, the more consistent force for the Dolphins' defense. But I do think Phillips has a higher ceiling in a couple years down the road. Like I said earlier in the show, I'm curious to see what the Dolphins do with Ogba, whether they retain him going forward or not. I really do think it depends on whether or not this regime stays or if someone else comes in and they want to spend their money in a different way. If I had to guess, I think it's more likely than not that Miami brings Ogba back than Gasicki. Because just based on what we've seen from this regime so far, I have no faith the Dolphins are going to make the the high price maneuver for a tight end. Now, if a new you know GM comes in, a new identity, and you want to be more explosive, a more offensive-minded approach, you bring back Gasicki over Ogba if you have to pick. But Miami has a ton of money, and you should keep the in-house talent that you know is working, and that is Ogba and Gasicki. The final dud for Miami, no surprise here, Jacoby Brissac. He finished the game 26 of 43 for 244 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Now, I'm not going to harp too much on this. I've said what I've said about Brissette, or like I affectionately have called him, Jacoby Brissac. If Miami is forced to play the Ravens with him under center, I fear for an embarrassing performance on national TV. That's what the Ravens do to us, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Miami, theoretically, should feel some positive momentum right now. We, you know, we've had seven losses in a row. Our only taste of victory was to start the season. And finally, the team has learned, oh, this is what it means to close a game. This is how it feels to win compared to the last month and a half, nearly two months of losses. They've lost so many games in a row that there's no doubt that the locker room mentally needed this win. Again, the mental aspect, emotional aspect of pulling out a W, remembering how to properly finish a game strong and win as a team, that's huge for a struggling team. And that's what this game can serve to be. But no way can you expect continued success if that's the same performance as a team, specifically offensively, that you're going to see going forward. For the Dolphins to stand a chance, 
not only is this defense going to have to harass Lamar Jackson, and we'll get into this matchup in the next episode tomorrow, and look, they're going to have to contain the Ravens offense as a whole, which has not only historically been proven to be difficult, but based on what we've seen this year, is probably going to be difficult. But the Dolphins' offense must put up points on a consistent basis to stand a chance. Do I have any faith that we can put up a lot of points with Brissett? No, not at all. Maybe early in the game, you know, we'll get a touchdown on the first drive in the first quarter, get a couple field goals. But if you want sustained output for this offense as a whole, Brissett just can't be the guy. Here's my worry, though that he's going to have to be. Because remember, Miami's playing on a short week. It's Thursday night on NFL Network and Amazon Prime. The whole world will be watching. From what we know, Tua Tungavailoa apparently suffered an injury to the middle finger of his left throwing hand in the second quarter of the game last week in Buffalo. So not only does that explain maybe some of that relatively poor play, considering his finger just got completely fucked, but it also meant that he was limited throughout the week leading up to this pass game. Then it was reported early Sunday morning that Tua had that small fracture, and in conjunction with the coaching staff, they decided that they were going to rest his finger in hopes that it would heal quicker. This is all the reports that we've gotten from Shefty. Now, the injury isn't bad enough where they made him inactive, right? It's not like they knew going into the game that he wasn't able to play, because if that was the case, he wouldn't have dressed. He threw in warm-ups, and he was dressed just in case Brissett got hurt. He would have played. Tua would have played in this game against the Texans if things weren't going well, we were losing maybe late, or if Jacoby got hurt. Here's the deal. You can look at this situation, because there is a lot of conspiracies going on out there. You can look at this a couple of ways. The sinister take, right, that there's some unknown reason behind the scenes that led to Tua being sat. Maybe he showed attitude. His agent showed attitude this week because of all the Watson revelations. He has every right to if he did. Maybe his head wasn't really in the game plan and Flores wanted to discipline him and sat him as a result. Maybe Tua himself was a little banged up and he's like, screw you guys. Why would I put my body on the line for you when you clearly aren't even giving me the most tiny modicum of respect? So maybe he sat in protest. There is reason, again, that Tua missed this game other than injury. The way the front office also has behaved over the last eight months points to that, right? Recent reports of meddling makes them, as a front office, hard to trust. So when they come out and say, ah, Tua's hurt, that's why he didn't play despite being dressed, it's hard to take them at their word. Considering also how Flores has treated Tua with the benchings last season, placing him on IR this season when he potentially could have returned sooner than the three weeks that he was forced to miss, again, The potential for something shady to be going on is there. Now, as big of a doubter as I've become in this regime, I actually don't think any of those things are the case. As as exciting as those takes are, I don't think that's what's going down and why he was held out. Now, if Tua was held out of the game, right, due to disciplinary reasons, so if it was one of the first things we mentioned, he was protesting, his agent was protesting, his head wasn't in the game, for whatever reason, then I don't think we would have seen him listed, you know, multiple times on the injury report this week. It would have kind of come out of nowhere, this benching. And frankly, the team likely would have sent that message by not letting him dress. They would have elevated a third quarterback to the active roster and Tua would have been inactive. So that's why I don't believe he missed the game due to some, you know, conspiracy of his demeanor. Now, could Tua be so upset with the Dolphins that he's pulling a Devontae Parker and hamming up a finger injury a little bit? That's always possible. Tua is human. He, like we said, has ample reason to be pissed at this organization for how they've handled him with the open flirting for Watson. But here's the thing. The type of behavior that we just described doesn't really benefit Tua at all, and it also doesn't align with his character from what we know it to be. Tua's generally a team-first guy. If he could go, he probably would have gone, and to be entirely honest, he probably wanted to go. I believe Flores' general analysis of the situation, because Tua playing is the best thing for him at this point in time. Miami probably did see him throw the ball. He was hurt. He is hurt. And so they're like, all right, we're going to try to have our quarterback go. They go out there, see him throw the ball, and he looked fine on shorter throws, but there was clear, you know, pain and his his accuracy might have struggled at the deeper to intermediate levels due to that swelling that we do see on pictures of that middle finger. So knowing you have a short week coming up, knowing you're playing the Houston Texans where even with Brissett, you should win the game, and they did, 
resting him not only makes sense, considering the opponent, but if there's any hope of him returning for Thursday night against the Ravens, you don't want to risk aggravation of the finger in-game. Him hitting it, there's no way he'll come out of the game with his finger feeling better than if he didn't play at all. So I do think the team decided to hold him out. And look, it paid off because the Dolphins did pull out the victory over Houston, and you got to rest your quarterback who's battling a little bit of an injury. But going forward, we're going to have to keep a keen eye on the situation because here's my view of this upcoming game against the Ravens. If you have Tua, you have hope. You could potentially pull something out of your behind. If not, we're not winning this game. I believe Miami will play coy with his health, so I don't think a clear answer is going to come through in the few days leading up to the game. But again, that's smart because Baltimore then is not only going to have to prepare for Tua if he does play, but also Brissett because you don't know who's going to start. And that divided time on a short week benefits you to potentially come out swinging with something they haven't seen or prepared for. Look, not that there's really much to prepare for for the Baltimore Ravens, considering this offensive attack. But we'll get more into the specific matchup again, like I said, considering, look, a win here would be kind of mind-blowing. It, you know, it would be a reason to watch this game and hope for a win because it would kind of change the potential complexion of where this season could go based on what's been going on. Because, look, there's some easy games coming ahead, and the Dolphins would be 3-7, and seven, looking at a two-game winning streak against a pretty tough team in the Ravens with the Jets twice, the Giants, and the now reeling Panthers. A win changes the potential, you know, not only for Flores, but for Tua. It just it would mean a lot. So it is a little bit of a reason to watch them tune into the game. Should we hope? Are there reasons to hope? No, not really. No, there isn't. But the Ravens' defense, the positive here, is not nearly as dominant as they have been in years past. You know Flores should be dreaming about revenge since he was embarrassed week one of 2019. Miami also plays at home. And the Ravens are coming into this short week following a pretty emotional game that was physical and went into overtime. So they played an extra quarter of football when compared to the Dolphins. The other reason this is big is not only did the Ravens roster have to play those five quarters, but they also won the game. So the chances for a mental letdown, that trap game, are higher. Had Baltimore lost... I would have expected a renewed focus from them and a different locker room, right? They would have been like, damn, we just played our hearts out and lost. Let's get our shit together. Because that's what good teams, good teams do. It's human nature for them if they lost to be like, damn, like, let's refocus. Let's get our crap together. But when you win in a tough situation, you played your hearts out, you're sore, you're not feeling, maybe you're just, nah, maybe you let things slide. And the Dolphins can make themselves a little room in that slide. But look, the fact that they won is a good thing generally for us, in my opinion. Here's the reason to be worried. The Dolphins are the Miami Dolphins. This defense, despite some positive play in recent weeks, can easily be humiliated by Lamar Jackson. He could come out firing on all cylinders, and we won't stand a chance. To make matters worse, Miami's recent successes in run defense could also fall to the wayside, and most importantly, Jacoby Brissett could start, meaning the Dolphins' offense will be the lethargic and consistently giving the ball back to the Ravens' offense to wear down Miami's defense and let them run away with the game. But we'll keep an eye on the injury report, as well as Brian Flores' body language as he meets with the press prior to Thursday night's game. So what do you think about this week? Does, does it even matter? Are you even hopeful or do you even give a shit anymore? Do you have hope that maybe a little win streak could be rattled off here and we could upset the world and upset the Ravens? Or was this win over Houston pretty empty? It's just a bad team beating a slightly more bad team. Let us know in the comments below. On a less pleasant note, I hate to bring back bad memories, but how long did the your last game against Baltimore stick with you and you still having nightmares about it the way that that, that whole afternoon went down? Uh, Baltimore was that 2019? That's the one. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a tough one. That was definitely a, a tough game. Um, but you know, this team is completely different. And then I always tell the story of you know back then I didn't even know you know some of the guys I was lined up with. I didn't even know the name. So, um, but this team is a lot different. We're uh, we're better coaches. We have better players. So, uh, you know, Thursday is definitely gonna be a challenge. But we definitely gonna uh, have some fun Sunday. I mean Thursday. 
That's going to do it for us here today. Thank you guys so much for listening to the Fins Pod. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, as always, to Timothy Ritchie, Brian Guger, and Go Hydra, members of the pod and supporters of the show, over on Patreon. Check that out. Links in the description or head to patreon.com slash finspod. Thank you all again so much for the continued support. And now that the LSAT is over, I will be back churning these vids out back to normal. So please remember to like the video, subscribe, just so you never miss a chance to chat about your Miami Dolphins. And remember that the Fins Pod's available anywhere you listen to, you know, podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and of course, YouTube. If you like the show, we'd love a review on Apple Podcasts. Help us out. And as always, continue the conversation with us over on Twitter and Instagram at Fins Pod. I hope you all have an amazing day. And until next time, stay safe. Love y'all.